I have to be open to the fact that maybe archaeologists will uncover some scroll that just disproves my whole hypothesis. But like, does he have to do that every time he defends his view? What if he just forgets during a presentation? So if you maintain a material and a functional view of ontology or creation, then it seems to me that you're committed to saying that God didn't actually make anything on three of the six days, half the week, four, depending on where you fall on the uh, the sky trichotomy. I, we have to ask, what kind of material creation account is this if it doesn't have God making anything material for half the week? To me, you could read days three, five, and six as being about material origins, uh, but whether or not that's function only, it really like has to be informed by the exegesis of the rest of the text. Because in isolation, like you can see, yeah, there, there's nothing inherently out of context, nonsensical, but, you know, let the earth bring forth animals. You know, there was no animals and then they popped out of the ground. You don't need every last person to hold to a functional ontology instead of a material ontology for Walton's view to go through. We just have to show at minimum that it was the dominant view. Hi everyone, this is what your pastor didn't tell you. Today I'm talking to Evan Minton of Cerebral Faith. We are talking about uh, scholarly responses to John Walton's view of immaterial origins in Genesis 1. Uh, how are you doing, Evan? Tell us a little bit of your background and just your, your podcast, YouTube channel, all the stuff you're doing right now. Yeah, my name is Evan Minton. I run a web-based apologetics ministry called Cerebral Faith. Uh, it is turning 10 years old this August. Um, and I started it as it, it started out as just a blog. I had been studying apologetics for like a year and a half after uh, having a, a, a crisis of faith, um, talking to uh, skeptics on the Internet and then bringing just a whole bunch of uh, objections I couldn't answer. Um, and, you know, I, I had doubts and I, I prayed about it. I said, you know, God, if you're real, give me show show me. And so I was led. I I was led to Lee Strobel's books, and I read them, and that that kind of opened opened me up to a whole world of scholars like Craig Evans and William Lane Craig and um, J. P. Moreland, and all all sorts of apologists that gave philosophical, scientific, and historical arguments uh, for the truth of the Christian worldview. Um, and so I'd been reading uh, all sorts of books on arguments for God's existence, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And I uh, was using what I had learned to dialogue with skeptics. And on the internet, I found that I had to sort of ad address some of the same objections over and over and over again. I'm like, this is rather cumbersome having to type all this out every time. And mainly, this is something I have in common with Tim Stratton of Free Thinking Ministries. Mainly, I just started the blog so that I could write out my thoughts on something. And then if somebody brought it up in an online discussion, I said, hey, I wrote about that over here. <laughs> Go check it out. So I wouldn't have to just type out the, the same things over and over again. Uh, and I did that for from like 2000, uh, 2012 to 2018. And I then I decided I started noticing that a lot of people have podcasts and a lot of apologists, a lot of apologists and biblical scholars and theologians have podcasts on biblical stuff. And I thought, I'm going to I think I think it might be good to start a podcast. I might be able to reach more people that way. And so I did. That's been running from, I think, 2000, 2009, early 2019 to the present. Uh, and then I, in 2020, I decided to start a YouTube channel because I noticed a lot of people like when it comes to free online content. I get the impression nowadays that most people go to podcasts and uh, and YouTube uh, rather than written articles. Uh, I'm sure there's some people who still read uh, written articles, but I, I think mainly if I want to, you know, reach a whole bunch of people with with my content, I think you know YouTube and the podcast is where it is. And I, I talk about a lot of different subjects. I talk about arguments for God's existence, like the Kalam, fine tuning, moral arguments, ontological arguments. Talk about the reliability of the New Testament. I defend the minimal facts argument for the resurrection of Jesus. Talk about the problem of evil. And I talk about uh, ancient Near Eastern biblical stuff, like some of the stuff we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, so if you're interested, go check it out. It's The website is called CerebralFaith.net, and all of my contents, whether it be 
blog articles, podcast episodes, YouTube videos. They can all be they can all be um, consumed from that website. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's pretty funny to do all this considering, you know, I've been following you for a long time and, you know, finally getting to talk to you. So it's a lot of fun. So specifically, uh, I want to talk about kind of like our goal for what we wanted to do today. Um, you know, obviously we talked about like, you know, what scholars kind of like the objections that scholars have brought up in regards to John Walton's view of immaterial origins. Um, so, you know, firstly, I, the, the main goal was to one, give, additional arguments if you know the if the objections maybe aren't uh are maybe missing something to, or maybe maybe clarify views and um and that'll that'll help people uh, understand the view better but also give uh you know obviously the audience an ability to uh see what the scholars are saying why do people disagree with walton in some regards i i do like i do like looking at objections to walton's view because especially the the functional origins aspect of it. Um, there are more people who uh, take the temple inauguration aspect view. Uh, that's, I mean, it's not the majority, but it has a substantial following in Old Testament scholarship. But when it comes to that, you know, Genesis one is about is not about material origins. Uh, that gets a lot of pushback from a lot of people. Uh, Walton and myself and you, we are we are definitely in the minority. And when when one holds to a minority view. Uh, I like to look at like why do people disagree with this? Because it seems it seems true to me. But am I in a more is the majority the majority for a good reason? And I've looked at a whole bunch of uh, objections to what I like to call the Waltonian view. Uh, but it's just I, I haven't found one that has been convincing enough yet for me to abandon it in favor of some other interpretation of Genesis one. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's definitely, definitely a good idea to look at the objections and, um, but I, I see this as even just a opportunity to promote the view. Even if, even if I'm not going to say that, you know, I'm hundred percent certain of anything like that, but, um, that it definitely needs to be, uh, talked about more i think in my opinion at least so yeah uh evan you want to possibly give us uh, a brief overview of how walton sees genesis one in regards to immaterial origins and um and i guess you can throw in a little bit of temple inauguration part in there too if you want to real quick yeah well um i agree with walton's thesis about my view i, I think he doesn't go far enough i think he doesn't Right. I don't think he recognizes like the temple. Uh, I mean, uh, the polemic aspects that, you know, the author is taking shots at um, other creation myths, other theologies. Uh, but that's just that's a minor criticism. But like, yeah, the there's Dev Walton views. And I agree with him uh, on the stuff he does affirm that. Genesis 1 is not about scientific facts. It's not about material origins. It's not, uh, I used to see G Genesis 1 as being sort of like, sort of like the opening theme of the sitcom, The Big Bang Theory, where it's like 14 billion years of history condensed into 30 seconds. Well, I used to, I, I used to be a day ager. I, I thought, that, you know, the days were long periods of time, and this was an, uh, an account of natural history. Um, I held to the view that uh, John, um, Hugh Ross defends in his book, Navigating Genesis. Uh, and that's what I thought Genesis 1 was. It's just 14 billion years of history condensed uh, into like seven days. But when we are approaching an ancient text, we have to interpret it the way the original author would have understood it. And they would the original author would not have known anything like, plate tectonics or big bang cosmology he would not have seen the creation of fish on day five as the cambrian explosion and so we have to get into that mindset that uh, that an that an ancient israelite how would they have interpreted it we have to get at what scholars call the authorial intent and so looking at ancient Near Eastern creation myths, looking at the original uh, language uh, that the, you know, he, ancient Hebrew that 
Genesis 1 was written in. Um, looking across the canon, because Walton believes, as I do, that not just Genesis, but the entire Bible is inspired. Everything from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 uh, is inspired. And so that can also, but especially the Old Testament, because that's that's really close in time to you know Genesis, relatively speaking. Um, and so we can, you know, through the work of exegesis, Walton presents his case that Genesis 1 is about God assigning functions to everything uh, that it, that exists, or, uh, you know, materially. Uh, he's not necessarily bringing it into physical being. Um, he's, he's creating, you know, he, on day four, for example, he creates the sun, moon, and stars to serve as uh, seat, signs for seasons, days, and years. And, yeah, so it's about this is going to serve this purpose, this thing is going to serve this purpose, and this thing is going to serve this purpose. And a second plank to his thesis is that God is, you know, he's assigning functions to all of these things that, you know, in the cosmos, the sun, moon, and stars, the birds, the fish, etc., because he is preparing the cosmos to be his temple. God is going to come into the universe and dwell in it as sacred space. He's going to make it, you know, sort of a massive, um, you know, it's, it's like, a, it's like a temple. And that's, he does that over seven days. That's the, that's the view in a nutshell. And, you know, obviously we're going to get into more of this as the, the video goes on, but that's, that's pretty much the bait. That's pretty much like, condensed nutshell bite-sized uh what the view is yeah and i'll just add real quick that um you can check out uh me and i'll have two links in the description one of a video or a link you can one of a video that, of evans that you can check out and one of mine i interviewed john walton on the very topic um and as far as you know to people new to this subject it might seem this might seem crazy to some people uh just for very very brief we would say that um you know this is what the we would argue is um we can see from the text as well as from the culture so well, walton and others would argue that the the ancient cultures when we read their other texts in the, in the same time period in the same locations we what we see is them also seeing things as uh you know, creation accounts coming from immaterial origins, not like the creation ex nihilo that we see today um, in a lot of these discussions. So, for example, um, in day one, day four, uh, you know, there's there's definitely no creation ex nihilo in regards to material creation, simply because the ancients wouldn't have seen stars and, you know, the sun and all that as same as we would, they wouldn't see as big balls of gas. It'd be light. Light is not a you know material object to them. So anyways, um, yeah, so let's keep going. So the first uh, thing we wanted to talk about, first, I guess, list of objections was from Noel K. Weeks. Um, now he's not alive anymore, but he used to teach at the University of Sydney. I found this extremely interesting because, you know, he definitely takes a scholarly approach. He's got a very uh, good background of the material. Um, you know, and he's also very clear, like there was only a few times where I was, had to reread it. Uh, it made, it made a lot of sense to me what his arguments were. What did you, what would you, what would you say the, the pros of his article were that you saw? Well, I would say that, that the pros is that he, he introduces like a couple, uh, you know, I'd say maybe two or three objections that I thought were actually potent. I had to stop and think about them for a little bit. Like mm, I could, I didn't just have an answer right away as is the case with a lot of anti-Walton articles I, I, I read. Um, some of them were really weak, but some of them were kind were rather potent. And um, it was definitely something, they were definitely new. It wasn't, it wasn't just like the same old, same old that I had come up, that had come across like a dozen times already. So, but as far as like, you know, what I think is wrong with the arguments, uh, I'll obviously save that for when we, uh, get into it all right cool so he, he i'd say he um we're obviously we're not gonna read the whole thing it's pretty long but i'll get into you know 
kind of summary as we go. Um, so the first part he talks about is how we don't really, well, he makes the argument that, you know, we don't have an exhaustive amount of text from the ancient Near. So if we're going to be able to say that, you know, all the cultures around the Israelites during that time period um, saw creation as creation um, in regards to function instead of, you know, like ex nihilo material creation, that the other cultures saw that. You know, one's argument is basically that all the other cultures saw that. So we should argue that Genesis 1 is in the same way. Weeks says, our written evidence is crucially biased towards one particular area, Mesopotamia, the land of the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. That is because of the durability of the text written on clay tablets. So essentially we're reliant on, you know, specific forms, mediums of what the texts have been preserved. So we don't have an exhaustive list. All right. So it is commonly claimed that Mesopotamian literary culture was diffused throughout the ancient Near East. That is because Mesopotamian cuneiform texts from the second millennium and earlier have been found in Assyria, Anatolia, Palestine, and Egypt. While the diffusion is not in question, its significance is. So just to be clear, He's not questioning whether, um, you know, all these texts in the second century, like, are, are widespread, like, we have a lot of texts in, from this area, in this region. Um, the, in the second millennium, the cuneiform script was adapted to write Hittite and Hurrian. Furthermore, Akkadian was adopted as the language of international diplomatic correspondence so that the Egyptian empire and its Palestinian and Syrian vassals corresponded in adapted forms of Akkadian. Since the cuneiform script and Akkadian were taught using literary texts, that means that scribes being taught to write would be copying Mesopotamian scripts, and such instru instructional texts have been found in Egypt. It is a reasonable assumption that all across the area between Mesopotamia and Egypt, scribes were copying Mesopotam Mesopotamian texts. There was at least enough interest for some Akkadian texts to be translated into Hittite. We have no idea how deeply these Mesopotamian texts penetrate into the mind and ethos of the locals. So basically he's saying is while it is widespread in the second the second millennium, which is you know 2000 BCE to 1000 BCE, the it it's one specific medium for the most part, and that it was written on, and um, we don't know that you know all of the you know the the local the layman of the of the time period would be familiar with these texts. So. Essentially, if we have, um, if we want to say that everyone in that time period have had a specific way of thinking, but the only texts we have are one specific people group or class of people, then we can't say that everyone thought that way. All right. So in the first millennium BC, however, we find a different situation. Cuneiform and Akkadian are not attested outside the homeland, aside from monuments reflecting Assyrian and Babylonian conquest. Our suspicion is that Akkadian has been had been replaced as the international language by much easier to write Aramaic, which, because of the perishable materials, has not survived. Since the majority of scholarly opinion, whether rightly or wrongly, is not the issue at the moment, would place the writing of the Old Testament in the first millennium and even late in that period in, re in regards to the Babylonian exile. The existence of cuneiform texts in Palestine a millennium earlier may not be relevant to the theories of its composition. So basically to say that if, if Walton cites a bunch of texts from, you know, the second millennium BC that it's irrelevant because the text was written in the first millennium BC. Just adding it all up and he's like, my basic point is that citing texts without concern for the unresolved question is not good, good scholarship. And I, I found that kind of like a weird comment, um, almost like he expects us, like Walton to mention all of this every single time he has that conversation. Either that or he just sees it a lot as a lot bigger issues than Walton does. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what he what he meant by that. Um, that was a point of interpretive ambiguity. I, I guess you're I guess what you said is uh, just about as good a commentary on that as, as any. <laughs> well, do you, do you think that these issues are big enough to mention for Walton? the like like he has to cite like all of the all of these uh, yeah like ambiguities where we don't know with you know with certainty that we have all the texts or there could be texts out there that 
we just haven't found or we just lost a lot. So maybe they thought differently than what the text we found. Like, I guess he, he could mention it, but if he wants to like, make sure that he doesn't overstate his case, like say, yes, that based on what we have, this, this, you know, extant text, this is the conclusion I've come to, but I have to be open to the fact that maybe archeologists will uncover some scroll that just, you know, disproves my whole hypothesis. But like, does he have to do that every time he defends his view? I, I don't think so. Like, what if he just, what if he just forgets during a presentation or what if he like, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, to me, you know, rephrasing the argument in my own words, it, it seems like to me that Weeks is like claiming that given the many texts that have been lost to history, can we really be sure that everyone in the in the ancient Near East was united on holding a functional ontology with the corresponding understanding of what it means to create something? You know, your ontology is going to inform you on what it means to create but, you know, create to bring something into existence. Well, what is existence? Uh, is it is material form all that's needed for something to exist or does it need to have a function as well? And, he, you know, we don't know how many people of the laity were reading some of these texts and a lot of the texts that were exist, you know, that survive, we, you know, the, the ones that didn't survive is just, you know, just as big and, you know, maybe some of those held to a material ontology. To me, uh, I think what would be de what would be devastating to Walton's view is a functional ontology being a given in the ancient Near East. Is if we have like a lot of texts that undoubtedly have a material ontology, uh, or could not be construed to only be about functions. Now, it is true that people can have different views and ideas of things. Uh, for example, in Jesus's day, there was the party of the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't even believe in souls or angels. Then there were Pharisees who believed in the resurrection, souls, angels, uh, and they, you know, they disagreed with each other. And in the modern day, you have a lot of different competing views on things. You have a lot of different competing views on cosmology, on science. Um, even even though it's the norm, not everyone holds to Big Bang cosmology and evolution. Not everyone holds to a spherical Earth. There are the Flat Earth Society is a thing. And so I think it might be too daunting of a task to try to prove a universal mindset of the ancient Near East, like every last person who was alive at that time thought this way. In fact, it might be unreasonable. Um, I think really all that's needed for Walton's proposal is to go through is if a functional ontology is the uh, is at least the dominant view. Even if you can find some exceptions here and there, even if there were maybe more exceptions that didn't survive, if it's at least the dominant view, well, that shows, well, this is the general thought. Just like, you know, you can, somebody 3,000 years from now could say, well, most people believe at that time believed in a spherical earth. Yes, there are these people who didn't not, who believed it was flat, but Given all, given how many people did believe the Earth was a sphere, um, it's very likely that I don't know Barack Obama or Bill Gates or whatever famous person is being talked about in the history books. Uh, this probably he probably held to to that view, and let me see. Let me look at my notes. Uh, what else? No um, yeah. Also, uh, what recently? Well, not recent, well, relatively recently, like last fall, uh, I had Old Testament scholar Ben Stanhope on the Cerebral Faith podcast, episode 118. It's not on YouTube. That was before I decided to fuse the two. Um, it's episode 118. Ben Stanhope responds to Terry Mortensen's article, Reading Genesis, Any &E Hermeneutic versus Plain Meeting. Uh, ben Stanhope told me uh, that he's read lots of creation myths outside of the ancient Near East, and they all lend themselves towards a function-only sort of view. And I transcribed a bit of that uh, yesterday. Uh, he said this at like 49, 49 minutes into the episode. He said, quote, When I was in college, I went and I got several books that just contained creation myths from all around the world. And this is before, I think, that Walton had even published. 
I didn't even have this on my mind, but I remember being distinctly disappointed because I was expecting to open these up and it would be like in ancient Greek creation myths where there were very where they were very often concerned with material formation of the cosmos, but in every other creation myth of every other civilization, they aren't. They're typically concerned with function, just like Walton claims that Genesis 1 is. That's not just the ancient Near Eastern stuff. That's all around the world. That just blew my mind. As a modern person, I was just so disappointed with that expectation that I was bringing to these ancient texts from Papua New Guinea or Australia or Africa and so forth. Those authors and those native cultures did not care about my concerns about what they thought about the material formation of the cosmos. End quote. Um, and he then said that he couldn't remember the the title, but the author's last name is Sproul, and that he cited it probably 15 times at the at the end of his book, Misinterpreting Genesis. I looked it up, and the book is by B. Sproul. It's called Primal Myths. It's produced by New York, Harper and Row in 1969. Uh, if that's the case, I think that would be a strong rebuttal to Weeks' claim. Uh, again, we don't need to we don't need every last person to hold to a functional ontology instead of a material ontology for Walton's view to go through. Um, we just have to show at minimum that it was the dominant view. Uh, and, and maybe at a different approach we could take is that we don't even have to say that most or yeah, yeah, most most people in that time period took like a functional approach to how they saw the world. I think we can also say that most scholars would, you know, maybe more liberal than others, but most scholars would say that uh, and on the topic of Genesis 1, that it was written like either around the Babylonian exile or, or any, any time around there. In that case, all we have to do is show that the, the Babylonians had a functional orientation of the world. And along the same lines, you have um, in, in Egyptian regards as well, when if you say that it's written at the time of um, when the Israelites are going out of Egypt and Moses is writing it. I mean, I'll be really, so like a lot of people will say, okay, the, the Genesis text was written, you know, way before Moses. Well, at some point he did write it down and we know that it has been updated in some regards as far as the redaction and, you know, just like cities like Dan or whatever. And, um, and we know with pretty much certainty that the language was updated in general because we have older texts from like uh, the Song of Moses, where right when they come out of Egypt, where the language is a lot different than the rest of the book, which it's a lot older. It's a lot. Uh, um, so linguists will say that, you know, it's most definitely part of a different time period, definitely older than the rest of it is. Um, it just wasn't wasn't updated. So we know that the text was definitely updated in some regards. Um, and in that case, it's just like, okay, well, why couldn't that one part of the text, the Babylonian, the non, the the functional orientation have been added later? Um, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good point because like, it's not really debated among scholars that, you know, Old, Test Old Testament scholars, that is, that the Bible in the Old Testament in general is interacting with like the Baal cycle and, and some of Israel's neighbors. I mean, I say I like to say that that's how the prophets did apologetics. Like they didn't have to establish the existence of God like we do today. They just had to establish the supremacy of God. And they would do that by taking titles from different deities and saying, well, yeah, God did that. He's the cloud writer. He's the one who killed Leviathan and so on and so forth. And yeah, I think it that. That is, I think, all you have to establish at minimum is to say, well, the ones that Israel was specifically concerned with interacting with, um, if they if they held to a functional uh, ontology, then even if it isn't the dominant view, I, I think I, I think it it is. I think if you read, I read other creation myths from around the store, and then you you know you have those. Uh, ones that Ben Stanhope said he'd read from read from like Australia and Africa. It, it just, um, but yeah, I think I think you make a good point. But you know, like I said, like it doesn't have it doesn't have to be every last person. Like not everybody today holds to a spherical Earth. 
but most of us do a good bit of us do um it may be or you know it may be more like the split between special create you know intelligent design and evolution uh it's kind of a you know, you, you can, you, but you can make a probability judgment. Exceptions don't, aren't, you know, if you find like one exception, it isn't like going to just shatter the whole hypothesis. Yeah. Well, and I mean, of course we have the biblical text too. So that's, that is definitely the immediate context. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that's, that's also important. And I'm going to be talking about that with, with, with regards to some of his other arguments, how it's like, okay, cool. He seems yeah. to like a lot of the time he just, he seems to think that like, the A and E cultural context is like the only thing that the view has going for it. I, I, get, I get that impression. I, I, I find it interesting that just in regards to the second millennium text, he doesn't make an argument for what is missing, like giving us possibilities or like why we should think something's missing. It's just we have no idea how deeply these Mesopotamian texts penetrated into the mind and ethos of the locals. So it's just like, it's just like, okay, it's possible. It's like, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, with that, I, I also, this is not something that I wrote down in my notes, but uh, this is something that occurred to me now. It's like, maybe it's not the people are getting the idea from the text. Maybe the texts are the result of the widely held idea. Like people thought, people thought this and people thought this is what creation means. This is what existence means. And that's just reflected in their texts. So in that case, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't mm -hmm. matter if, you know, some, Joe Schmo Babylonian read Enuma Elish or not. Another quote I found really interesting was he says, once more a methodological issue in truth. I think there were huge differences between Mesopotamia and Egypt, but if they were not, would it be valid to cite the evidence of each just of just these two cultures as revealing the universal mind of the Aini? So that kind of that kind of gets into what um we're talking about, like um I well, I think what he's doing is he's attacking Walton's claim that we have like the, the the entire engineers would have thought in these immaterial ways with ontology immaterial ontology um i don't think he's maybe he probably i don't think he's definitely he's definitely not attacking you know my or your approach what we talked about earlier um yeah well yeah i mean you, you do have to be careful about not overstating your claim and i guess the way that he words it. And I, I guess maybe I've worded it that way too. It, it may come across like we think, yes, every last person held to these. Um, I, and I do think, I, I do think that weeks does well to caution us to be careful about claiming something is the definitive universal view on something in the ancient Near East. But ultimately, you know, even if you do find a few exceptions, I, I think that the evidence we have, is in favor uh, of the functional origins view rather than, you know, those who would try to contend that, you know, it's about material. Yeah, well, I think you'll find it interesting. I don't know if you watched my video on it, but um, the, the interview I did have with Walton, like we talked about different texts um, from the ancient Near East. And, you know, he said, basically said that, you know, there's, there's zero texts that he knows about that, you know, that we can de definitively say that it's about material origins and it's not really um, like he would say that the, they are all in regard the, all the focus of all of them is immaterial origins um, in regards to you know creation texts. Um, oh, I would say that all the ones that I can think of uh, are you know about material origins. Of course, I haven't read ever I, I haven't exhaustively read so i you know i have to make the caveat that you know maybe there's a text over here that you know is mm -hmm. about material origins that i just don't know about yet um but yeah all of the ones that come to mind i think I, I think walton is right so he also he had an interesting question um so basically he's talking about the likenesses between the different cultures that we see in the text in the Bible, also Mesopotamia, Egypt, all that. Could the likenesses derive from the fact that both are economies built upon artificial irrigation systems? And I'd say yes, but not all of the similarities. Um, so like, sure, you have, uh, you know, have these interesting, like the flood narratives and how they could, they can come back to, you know, a, a universal idea that 
you know, there, I mean, there was a lot of water, a lot of flood, you know, it was specifically Egypt and other nations where a lot of their uh, economy was based on the Nile. So, you know, it's the end of the world if, if that floods over. But do, I don't know, what do you think? Could the likenesses that we see in these other cultures, could they simply just have derived from economies built on artificial irrigation systems? Do you think that? Yeah, like you said, I think I think maybe that is the case in, in some cases. When it comes to A&E parallels with the Bible in general, like you do need to caution yourself against what has been called parallelomania. But also there are, you know, legitimate parallels like you know God, Yahweh being called the one who mounts the makes his his throne uh his chariot the he makes the clouds his chariot that's what Baal was said to do and you you find and even in Daniel 7 you find Je you know the son of man he's the you know he's riding on the clouds and he takes his seat next to the ancient of days and this kind of looks kind of similar to uh El and Baal you know, Baal is like the right hand man of of El, the the head deity at Ugarit, um, and you know, and we know from the you know the historical narratives in the Old Testament, Baal was like the number one rival of Yahweh. The prophets just had you know so much trouble trying to like whenever they, the Israelites wanted to commit idol idolatry, like Baal was number one on their list. So. You put you take that into consideration also. Uh, you know how much would you know in the in the context of polemics like that? How you know how likely is it that they would want to interact with that text to kind of you know put Baal lower on the spiritual hierarchy and exalt Yahweh? So you have to look at exactly what the parallels are. Uh, is it just you know is this a little bit like this or is it are the parallels big enough and numerous enough and striking enough where you like you can say, yeah, there's definitely interaction here. Yeah, and of course, just as one eleven, I don't know your thoughts about that. I interviewed uh, Inspiring Philosophy the other day, and you know he was talking about how just as one eleven. So there's a lot of what seems like similarities between other texts. Um, you know obviously enumerated ish uh the how the sons of god are seem to be very similar to Upkalu and tower of babel seems to be in and you know obviously obviously nimrod is is very similar to uh you know definitely has babylonian what seems like influence to the text um it seems like that's what was in mind when they were writing it um but you know he doesn't actually think you know it was copied or they were looking at the same text when writing it but just that there were these, you know, cultural influences that that wrote a, um Yeah, I mean, there's like definitely themes. It's, I don't think you can. De I definitely don't think you can say it's just like you know how the society is set up in regards to just like you know irrigation and all that. Um, but in regards to Noel's point, he says, might peripheral non-irrigation societies be different in regards to? Uh, I guess he's referring to functional ontology here which, uh, or maybe he's just talking about similarities and in, in the different, yeah, so it seems like he's just talking about the similarities in the different texts. And, you know, in that regard, it's like, yeah, so some of it might be different. Um, if we were to find um, some, you know, non-irrigation societies um, that were writing on this, but we don't, uh, so. And it might know. also just be that they play, you know, time weather and fecundity wouldn't be like the, the most important things and not come at the start of the creation account they might have some yeah. alts, uh but they might still hold to a functional ontology right yeah i don't see any reason why that specifically would would change how we how they would see the world in that regard um of course you know we're making an argument based on what we do know not what we don't know so you know you can only say so much from you know, arguments from silence like that. All right, so Walton is putting a proposition to the evidence that the evidence is a poorly equipped answer. I can give two instances, which it seems to me point to an ability to existence without function. One is the test that was put to God, to the god Marduk, where he had to show the ability to destroy a constellation and then recreate it, both by simple speaking. He's saying um, point to an, an ability to conceptualize existence without function. So he, it's, it's their... He's trying, to, he's trying to say that 
when they're just, he's destroying the Mark is destroying the constellation that the existence isn't the focus here. Um, but I I don't really see that. Um, I mean, what what are constellations to them? I think that's the main focus. Um, you know, in that culture, you it's not you know big balls of gas. It's not just like little lights in the sky. They have they do have functions. That's the main purpose. But to them, that is their basically. No, that's their that's their existence. Like, because without function, then there's there's no point. It's just little lights from the sky. That's all. Um, and you know they would have been for navigation and you know ag for agricultural calendars. Um, they, I think there's a good argument to make that they would have been seen as gods, the the stars and the the lights in this. And um, and if that is so, then it doesn't really even make sense to say that a god is it doesn't have a function. And he says, the second is the drunken competition between the gods Ninma and Enki, where the test is whether one can create a human so deformed or restricted that the other cannot assign a role to the specimen of humanity. Surely here there is a conceptual distinction between existence and function. Yeah, so, and, and then he mm -hmm. goes on to say um, that, you know, Certainly they did not think uh, of bare existence, but once we have exceptions, Walton's argument is crucially weakened. Why could not a biblical author also be an exception? And I'd like to like address that last sentence first. Um, yep. Okay, Weeks, he seems to think that the functional creation view rests solely on showing a universal mindset of the ancient Near East. Yet at the end of the day, we are concerned with what the biblical text actually says, not just what everybody else around Israel uh, thought. Um, the ancient Near Eastern mindset, it can be helpful in informing us and it can give us a probability judgment about, okay, well, everybody else thought like this or almost everybody else, or many other people thought like this, that maybe prob they probably thought like that too, but we still have to look at what they say because, you know, as John Walton puts it in another book, not The Lost World of Genesis 1, but The Lost World of Scripture, he says, you know, imagine the, the, the cultural ideas is like a river. Sometimes Israel goes with the flow and sometimes they swim upstream. So it's not sufficient just to do a survey of extra biblical texts uh, and call it a day. We have to also go to the biblical text and see if the biblical authors follow suit. So an ancient Near Eastern background can strengthen an exegetical case uh, for a point you're trying to make. But if you, uh, you know, then if you just stuck with the biblical text alone, and you know you can bring ancient Near Eastern stuff and say, you know, look, they all thought like this too. That kind of, you know, bolsters the likelihood that you're making from within the biblical text. But it doesn't, it's not determinative of it. Um, secondly, as I already said, I think it's an it's an overstatement to, to say that exceptions crucially weaken Walton's view. All Walton and other proponents of his view would need to do is just revise their argument um, and make, you know, make more modest claims about the ontological views of the ancient Near East. Um, but if it can be shown that functional ontology was the dominant view, or it, at least the views of the of the societies that the biblical authors are interacting with at minimum, um, then that makes the functional ontology of Genesis 1 more probable than not. Now, third, I want to get to the examples uh, that Weeks claims are the two exceptions. First, the first example is Marduk making a star go in and out of being. And this is how the, the text reads it from Tablet 4, lines uh, 21 to 29. Quote, your destiny, Baal, is superior to that of all the gods. Command and bring about annihilation and recreation. Let the constellation disappear at your utterance. With a second command, let the constellation reappear. He gave the command, and the constellation disappeared. With a second command, the constellation came into being again. When the gods, his fathers, saw the effect of his utterance, they rejoiced and offered congratulations. Marduk is the king. They added to him a mace, a throne, and a rod, end quote. One response could be that it could be offered that uh, he's presupposing what came into being means. Maybe Marduk rendered the constellation non-functional and then restored its function. That's possible, I'll, although I think perhaps a stronger argument is to say that although a &E peoples, at least generally, 
uh, if not most of them, even if there are possible exceptions, uh, thought of existence in terms of function in an ordered system. Nevertheless, they weren't completely unaware of material creation. Obviously, they knew that every, they knew that not everything they saw was eternal and like had always been there in a physical sense. I mean, babies are born, houses and temples are built, you know, trees are planted as a little seed, and then boom, you have a tree that wasn't there before. Um, but, and so they likely reasoned, hey, if something can come into existence physically, something can go out of existence physically, but like, would they have saw that as, you know, full existence? It's there, it has a physical form, therefore it exists. Uh, that's really the contention here. Uh, Walton is is arguing, you know, the, the or I guess the question is that is being posed is, is material composition all that's needed to say that something truly exists in the ancient mind? Uh, to phrase this philosophically, we could say that the ancients saw material composition as a necessary condition for existence, but not a sufficient condition. Uh, it something had to have a material body in order to exist, but if that's all it had, then it would not rightly be said to exist. So with that in mind, notice that if you physically annihilate something, you've not only removed its physical being, you've taken away its function as well. If an arsonist reduces a house to ashes, then it no longer functions as a home. Material form is logically prior to function, which is logically prior to its existing. So, you know, if Walton is correct, then Marduk making the star go come go out of being and come back into being, it was indeed a decreation and recreation of that star. He moved both the necessary prerequisites for or existence as material composition, as well as its function, you know, being a source of light for mankind. But of course, this is also presupposing that star a star for an ancient would be, you know, a big ball of gas, a, a material thing like it is in modern scientific understanding. Um, oh yeah, the and I, I think the same thing can be said about his second example. Um, ancient peoples knew of things coming into being and physically going out of being. And even, you know, even the way I talk about this, it portrays how the material ontology I have. But was this enough to say something was created, that something came into being? You know, maybe they, maybe they would have called it something like partial creation. So just to clarify in your answer here, so so I'm under the impression that Walton's view is that Genesis 1 is, you know, it's not about material, like, at all. Sir, sure, you have to have material there, but it's not about material there, material because, um, because, you know, he had to say that, you know, if, if you one back the clock right before creation, it would look exactly the same as it did after the creation account. Um, so essentially, um, in regards to this text, I was under the impression that, you know, uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about the text, when we're thinking about if they're, uh, they're concerned about functional ontology, um, the Im immaterial part of things, that if we can show that the text regards any material component at all, that it, it disproves Walton's claim is um, so when you say something like, um, yeah, if if the you know the star of the constellation is destroyed, um, yeah, it will destroy the function, but it it'll it'll destroy both of those material and functional parts of it. But I was under the impression that we're only for the Walton's view to go through that it has to only be concerned with the function. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, this might. This might be an uh, an exception uh, to the rule that um, that Weeks was talking about, but still, I don't think it really destroys Walton's claim. Again, you, generally speaking, you, you can marshal in a lot of texts that show that they're just not concerned about material. Maybe some people are a little concerned about material, but even the ones that like, if they talk about material, it's just the material is there. But these might be these might be the exceptions to the rule. Um, but I don't think it destroys Walton's claim because, again, you have, at least generally speaking, at least the dominant view is they're not concerned about that at all. 
But secondly, you, Walton, you, this really brings in, this really relates to like what I find to be the primary criticism that Waltonian critics bring up. They say, well, why couldn't it be both? Yet Genesis 1 is about God bringing material and assigning things their function. Um, and so they might they concede the functional element, but they say, yes, the, the, the material manufacturing is there too. And Walton gives several arguments for why that's problematic. You know, theoretically, it, it could be the case, but then when you really get into like the nature of the of Genesis one, which is you know what we're talking about primarily, um, it's problematic. And I'm gonna I'm going to just kind of speed run through those arguments. So day one, light and darkness is, are created. Neither were material on an ancient understanding. They didn't know about photons and wave particles and, and, and things like that. Uh, for them, if you if you couldn't touch it like this bottle, then it wasn't, it, if it wasn't solid, it wasn't material. Um, but also the separation of light and darkness show that it's not even light and darkness that's the focus of the day, it's time, it's the day-night cycle. Day two, um, the problem here is that if if you hold to a material origins view, then you're committed to saying that God created a solid dome up there. That's what the firmament is in ancient cosmology. Ancient dif different cultures believed the, so you know, uh, Israelites would have believed it was a inanimate solid dome. Other cultures would have believed it was a God up there, like the, the God, um, I think his name is Shu. Um, but, yeah, they all believed that something physical was up there. Well, the astronauts went to the moon. They didn't crash into anything on their way up there. We know there's nothing up there. Um, so if committing your another another option is to just say, you know, insert modern meteorology into the text and say, yeah, there's physical stuff up there. There's water molecules and cumulus clouds and there's lightning and ice and, and that stuff well you're, then you're reading modern meteorology into the text which is an act of concordism and if committing yourself to bad science or eisegeting good science into the text is something you'd rather not do then your only other options is to concede that this is about functional origins god's setting up the, the weather system or you can just say that the, the the when it says god made the sky that that's an incoherent statement um Day four, God creates the sun, moon, and stars. That's not material on the ancient Near Eastern understanding. Um, and functions are most explicit here anyway. They're, they are for signs, seasons, days, and years. It's timekeeping. Um, now, it's true that there could be different astrological understandings throughout the A&E, but I doubt anyone believed that they were big, giant gas balls. Um, they were either like in twinkling inanimate lights that were not tangible, or they were gods or some kind of other spiritual beings. So if you maintain a material and a functional view of ontology or creation, then it seems to me that you're committed to saying that God didn't actually make anything on three of the six days, half the week. Um, four, depending on where you fall on the, um, the sky trichotomy uh, that I presented. So I, we have to ask, what kind of material creation account is this if it doesn't have God making anything material for half the week? To me, you could read days three, five, and six as being about material origins, uh, but whether or not that's function only, it really like has to be informed by the exegesis of the rest of the text. Because in isolation, like you could you could see, yeah, there's, there's nothing inherently out of context nonsensical about, you know, let the earth bring forth animals, you know, there was no animals and then they popped out of the ground. Right. Yeah. So um, to keep going, and I just specifically wanted to mention um, in regarding to Ninma and Inki, where they test whether one can create a human so deformed or restricted that the other cannot assign a role to the spe specimen of humanity. It's, it's interesting. I think this can actually be seen to strengthen Walton's argument, because what it shows is that it shows the the connection between existence and function. And it's like, could a God create something with no function? Like, what does that even mean um, to them? If function is the main ontology, 
no, a God could not create something without a function. All right, so he said something that I found interesting. He says, Walton is undoubtedly correct in saying that the temples were depicted as dwellings of gods. So at least he understands that, so that's good. He says, Walton also refers to the statement that the Egyptian god Ta rested after making the gods and other things. However, his rest is not said to be in a temple. Um, so, so, I mean, if seems like if if we find one situation where uh, a god doesn't rest in a temple, does that mean that the whole temple inauguration view doesn't work? Yeah, I found this. I, I found this uh, one of the weaker objections. Um, it seems like he see, kind of sees Walton's view as like if it, if you were to put it in a syllogistic form, it would be one: if God, if a god dwells somewhere, it's a temple. Two: the Bible says the cosmos is God's dwelling place. For example, Isaiah sixty six one. Three: therefore, the cosmos is God's temple. And then weeks would go on to refute premise one by this counterexample where a god doesn't rest in a temple. So why say that the cosmos is a god's temple? Well, besides the fact that this isn't the only argument in favor of the temple inauguration interpretation, the, the, the temple aspect of Walton's view, um, I, a, a, you know, a god can dwell somewhere that isn't a temple, sure, uh, but... Temples are the normal dwelling places of a god. And, you know, a, a god just, a god, at least a god would desire to dwell in a temple rather than any old place. I, I, I think a good analogy can be drawn to humans. You know, most humans live in houses. Now, there's some who don't. There are some who live in apartments. There are some who live in RVs. There are some who are homeless and live under a bridge. But the norm even though there are exceptions, it's like humans live in houses, whether they be mobile homes or, you know, they're on, they're on the ground, they can't be moved. It, it's, it's a house of some kind. And so I think that the argument should, you know, to be fair, on page 72 of John Walton's book, he does say, and I quote, deity rests in a temple and only in a temple, end quote. And I think maybe that's why Weeks thinks that his exception is like such a powerful response. But nevertheless, it just seems akin to me, someone saying uh, humans live in houses and only houses. Well, then and then someone else points to a homeless guy and say, yeah, there, I've refuted your proposition and, and think that he's done something really important. So let's let's go here. We have. So we're talking about um, in the temple inauguration view, there we we have two texts that we found. One cylinders cylinder of Gudea, third millennium BC, as well as another the Ball Cycle, where a temple was built and the number seven is used. And Walton we'll makes the argument that because we have these two instances, that uh, it associates the number seven with temples. You know, I guess you have the idea of uh, completeness of perfection of how they would see the temple and then when we read that in the you know the genesis one account where you know it's all over the place i did a video on almost like 21 instances where it could be possibly using patterns of the number seven it's like you know the writer's probably making a point there and if it's associated with temple that gives us more uh, more a better reason to think that um it's you know it's genesis one is referring to a temple uh, so let's read this. He says, um, he says, two cases where the number appears in connection with temple building, this time from two different cultures. One case is from the most detailed description of the temple building that we have from the a &E, the cylinders of Gudea, ruler of the Sumerian city of Lagash around the end of the third millennium BC. Though this is the most elaborate description of temple building, we possess very little spaces devoted to the actual building phase. More space is given to the God's instructions to build the temple and the acquiring of the materials, the consecration of the building, and the accompanying of celebrations. It is in connection with the last that seven days appear, specifically as the period that peace reigned in the city, which by invocation would be the period of the celebration of the building when the gods were treated to a great feast, which humans also enjoyed. The Did you want to respond to that at all? Uh you can There's keep another going. one. I kind of okay. have a whole response to that entire subject okay. there. 
The second case occurs as part of the Ugaritic myth of Baal. We are told in connection with building a temple for Baal that after the precious materials had been assembled, fire raged in the accumulated material for seven days, at the end of which the temple was revealed in magnificent completion. Um, once again, the question arises of whether this is adequate evidence of the universal any mind. Strictly speaking, the seven days in Gudea are not days of building, but of celebration. Well, can somehow what nullify the force of that uh, fact by claiming that the biblical text is not about the building of the cosmos, but about the devotion of various parts of it to functions. Nevertheless, the seven days with Gudea appear to be after the building is fully equipped and occupied by its divine householders. It is not as though that seven days are a major theme of the text. They occur in one line referring to what happens in the city during the period of celebration, rather than what happened in the temple. The building of the temple is the theme of an inscription on a statue of Gudea, and once more, the seven days appear in connection to what happened in society rather than with the temple. No other Mes Mesopotamian temple building text mentions seven days. The descriptions of Gudea are not a style that points to cultic use. Actually, the Baal text appears more significant because the seven days were connected this time to the formation of the temple. Once it was created by this miraculous means, Baal would have occupied it. Yet, if we exclude the Gudea text as isolated and not really relevant, is this one instance in a Ugaritic text sufficient evidence of the universal a &E mind? There are many cases of the use of seven as a significant number throughout the a &E. The connection of those uses of seven to the biblical past is a difficult question. The seven days in the Baal text may belong to the general tendency for seven days to appear as a significant period in any text rather than to a specific connection to temple building. Once again, this is insufficient evidence of a general any mentality. What do you think? So I uh, I had come up with a, resp a response to this, um, and I just thought, hey, you know, I'm going, why don't I ask uh, Ben Stanhope what he thinks of this? Because he's also, you know, cos big cosmic temple guy. He defends it in his book, Misinterpreting Genesis, How the Creation Museum Misunderstands the Ancient Near Eastern Context of the Bible. He also has some YouTube videos on it on his channel. Um, and he gave a response, which was basically the same response I gave, but it was much more uh, condensed. He was much less verbose than I am. So I'm just going to, you know, read what he said, because it's basically what I said, just much quicker to get through. He said, quote, all of our best and overwhelming evidence that the seven days in Genesis are related to temple building derives from comparing them to biblical texts about the building of Solomon's temple and the tabernacle. If we didn't have the Baal cycle or Gudea cylinder, the evidence that Genesis 1, seven days are related to temple building would still be absolutely overwhelming and beyond doubt and are accepted by such by virtually everyone I've read on the subject. So is the fact that Near Eastern temple, so is the fact that Near Eastern and temples are virtually universally patterned after the cosmos as a rule. These extra biblical cases are merely interesting, suggestive parallels that may contextualize, uh, that may, may be contextual or what we can already prove with the Bible. And then he goes on to say that he's read, uh, you know, in quote, and he, he says he, his, impre his impression was the same as mine. He says that He's read a ton of Weeks papers, and his strategy is to nitpick obvious gaps in our knowledge that everyone is a, in his field is aware of in order to give um, theologians who read his journals, he writes, the misleading impression that near ancient Near Eastern cosmology and the like is a myth with shady, uh, debatable support. And then below that in my notes is my response, which is that took up like four paragraphs, and then I wrote like, a whole Brobdenagian essay. <laughs> My notes are less like notes and more like essays. <laughs> nice, nice. So he he responded pretty pretty quickly then to you, huh? Yeah, he responded in a in a timely manner. Nice, that's funny. Um, yeah. So I was um actually gonna find the the text. I mean the the ball cycle. I mean, very obviously, seven days. Um, sure, it is about material. So Walton says that, um, you know, the texts in regards to the tabernacle and the temple, they, he would say that he wouldn't consider that a temple until it was inaugurated. And so the material aspect of the building isn't the big deal, but it's the inauguration process. And the ball cycle, it does 
it does seem to be focused on the physical part of the the bricks being formed and all that um perfected but you know still being changed and maybe not bricks but you know whatever the whatever was on fire um and then the Gudeo cylinder it says it took one year to bring the great stabs stones and slabs and took another year to fashion them although not even two or three days did it let i pass idly then it needed a day's work to set up each one but by the seventh day he had set them all around the house so it seems like that's also a little bit function or, or uh, physical oriented um but you know as you said that you know if, even if you don't want to say that you know these are good examples of it then and the, the point still stands um, that, you know, the, the immediate context is obviously going to be much more important. We don't, you know, to, to Weeks's point, we don't know if that the good idea and the, the boss cycle is the immediate context, although. So one gives little attention to the biblical text, which seemed to give God an alternate throne room. Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple goes out of its way to place God in heaven. If there's one topic on which the biblical and any view of the temple come together is the pre preservation from defilement. Is Walton to have us believe that God made this fallen and defiled creation in his throne room? Yeah, I was I was really astonished to read this. It sounds very much like Gnosticism, uh, which includes the idea that matter is evil, the, the material world is just it's bad. And so God can't have anything to do with that. And the Gnostics believe that, you know, God created like a lesser God. And then that lesser God, you know, turned into a bad guy and he created the, the he, and then he created the physical universe. And so, you know, putting kind of sandwiching this evil God in between the good God and the evil universe kind of separates God from, you know, getting his hands dirty, dealing with matter. Uh, now I know that weeks is, probably not a Gnostic, and that's probably not what he's trying to argue here, but it really sounds like something the Gnostics would applaud. Um, I just, how, why does he think God taking up his residence in the cosmos would defile him? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting, though, because, you know, obviously a lot of young Earth creationists would say that, uh, you know, the world's perfect at this point in Genesis 1 as in no sin at all. So in that case, you know, God would have no issue, you know, there, there'd be no defilement because, you know, the world's perfect. Uh, yeah. I mean, on the young earth scheme, like maybe you could say the, it still sounds kind of Gnostic, -y, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it is different. Like, okay. The, the world became fallen, like man became fallen. And so we got a lot of bad stuff in the world, like carnivores and, you know, predation. Um, but yeah, like at the very beginning during the week and when he, you know, comes to dwell with humanity, like, yeah, you're right. Like at that point, not even on the young earth scenario, uh, it, they, you know, they don't believe that there's anything wrong with the world at that point. I'd also add that, I mean, obviously God dwells in the temple. And, okay, maybe the temple is like, I mean, obviously it's sacred space. Um, but we would also argue that Genesis 1 and the Garden of Eden are sacred space. So it's not like, um, I don't know. It was like he's saying that God would never dwell and he would only dwell in heaven because that's, you know, he can't, he just can't work. He can't, he doesn't belong on earth. And I mean, obviously, that's not true because there's exceptions to that rule when he goes in the tabernacle. And um, and if we all agree that it's sacred space, um, which that obviously is true, if it's if it's perfect, then it has to be sacred. I mean, that just seems logical to me that that I don't see why he has any issue with that. Of course, of course, you know, in first Kings 8, 28, 22 to 53. Like, sure, there's passages where it talks about how, and, you know, other passages in the Bible that talks about how, you know, God doesn't belong in a temple, and he's too great for a temple. Um, but, obviously, he still gets the temple. Um, and there's almost a, a contradiction in terms as far as how they thought, as far as, like, yeah, God is 
in the temple, but he's also he dwells in the temple in regards to you know the the physical one Solomon's temple, but he also dwells in heaven. Um, and I don't I don't think we could say that there was like a contradiction in their minds or they saw that as an issue. Um, do you have any thoughts on anything yeah. I just said? With regards to like First Kings eight, like I think that all that's trying to do is just exp- the presence of God does go into the Jerusalem temple, but obviously that's not God. You know the full essence of God. God is transcendent. And I think that's what I think that's what Solomon is doing here. It, it, um, if I remember correctly, I think Solomon's the one who's speaking. Uh, but God Himself says something similar to that effect later in one of the prophets. I think it's Isaiah. Um, it's it's Solomon is basically saying, "Lord, you are so unlike these other gods. You are not you are not limited like them. How in the world are you going to, you know, make your dwell? You know, even the highest of heavens, not even the whole cosmos, can contain you. Uh, and I don't think anybody would of us would say that God isn't." You know, he is transcendent. He is, you know, the space-time realm he created can't fully contain him. But there is a sense at which he is present in the universe. Um, he was present in the cloud that led, you know, in the fire that led uh, Moses and the Israelites. He was present in the tabernacle. And he, especially later in biblical history, he was present in the, the person of Jesus, the Logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And and actually, it's very interesting. In John, he actually, I've read commentaries that said that he's, he uses the word, you know, a, a better translation would be the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Yeah. So you don't see any, do you see the, what seems like a contradiction and how the, the writers of the Bible saw how like God uh, was in heaven, but also in the temple. Do you see the difference there? Um, I think what is, what is being talked about here is, is that, well, you know, if God's temp, if I understand the point correctly, and I think this is the point that William Lane Craig made in his own critique of Walton is that, um, well, God has a temple in Jerusalem, so why would he need to make the whole universe his temple? But I think we need to remember that these are two different stages of Israel's history. One is, you know, when everything was the way it was supposed to be. Humans hadn't fallen yet. God had come to make his dwelling among humanity with them. And that is going to actually happen in the new heavens and the new earth. We see this in Revelation 21 and 22. But, you know, as N.T. Wright would say, the whole project got got abrupt. You know, he he aborted the project or he put it on hold because humanity went astray. And so we don't really have we don't have something like a Garden of Eden nowadays. We don't have that kind of sacred space on earth. Uh not since then and the jerusalem temple is the only thing that really came close to that after the after the fact yeah so um i think that's well put uh is there anything else you want to add that's that's all the notes i had for uh his article here yeah um that's that's all i that's all i've got okay all right cool so yeah that's all we have here for you guys today um I hope you guys enjoyed us talking about Noah Weeks' arguments as far as why he doesn't take the cosmic temple view as well as a immaterial origin view like Walton does. Um, let us know your thoughts in the comments, whether you disagree or anything else you want to add to the conversation. Um, uh, Evan and I will be doing uh, another video on the on, on other uh, scholarly refutations of Walton's view, so we'll see. Uh, how that goes and uh, make sure to like and subscribe to uh, both our channels so you can keep up to date with that yep so everyone make sure to go check out uh, evan's channel his podcast and his uh website as um he's got a lot yeah. of great info and uh the channel, the channel is called mm-hmm. cerebral faith video if you just type that in on the in on the youtube search engine it, you'll find it easily all right cool and um 
otherwise, uh, make sure to check out the links in the description as we'll be talking about, um, as we'll be, you know, you can learn more about Wong Ju and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, as I said, make sure to like and subscribe, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Keep using the brains that God gave you.